I want to talk to you kids a minute about having fun. You like to have fun, don't you? I liked to have fun when I was a kid. And, uh, I'm 83 and I still like to have fun. And so I've brought some of my things here to show you that I've had fun with over the years. Now, look, you could, you can sit in front of a television set all evening and come out and say you've had fun. But it's an awful lot of fun if you're doing something, creating something, playing with each other or things like that. And also, if you sit and watch television and say you've had fun, you enjoyed it, you have produced nothing in return. If you had fun making a project or something or, or working on things, you've had fun and when you get done you have something to show for, which is important. What I call a perfect illusion, it has a yellow spot on a sheet of plastic. Now it's not literally perfect, but I call it the illusion. of the yellow ball. Didn't that just look solid? Would you drop it in the cone for me, please? Now you will all recall, remember, first it was flat like that, first it was flat like that. And then, there it is. Watch the illusion of the yellow ball. Let me explain what happens. You see, I form this into a cone around my left index finger like this. Now, obviously, it is empty. The only thing I have to be careful about is that hole gets too large, the ball can get out. I'm going to roll this into a tube instead of a cone. You can see that the ball is still in there. Now, if I put one hand over each end of the tube, we all know it's literally impossible for that ball to get out, and this it is indeed flat like that. But let me explain what happens. You see, I form this into a cone like this, and I have the perfect illusion. That they <laughs> you know, when I was trying to fit, figure out some method of vanishing rubber ball, I thought of having it go up my left sleeve. Obviously, that's not at all practical. I discovered a very simple way to vanish a rubber ball. I discovered zone zero. No one ever thought of it before. This is zone zero. Whatever goes through that hole into zone zero, it instantly vanishes. Whatever goes through that hole into zone zero, it instantly vanishes. But I, it's, it's retrievable. I can reach right in there and get it back. Now, I did research on this, and I discovered it doesn't actually vanish when it goes through the hole. It's when I take my hand out that it's gone. I'm talking about totally, completely, absolutely gone, but always instantly retrievable. This look like it is in one layer or two. Good. Now it may not be where it's. Move your chair forward a little. I didn't get your chair forward. Of course. There you go. Now let me start it again. Now it may not be where it seems to be. Reach in and take a hold of it and stop it. Move, <laughs> move, no, hang on, Ted. Move it back and forth sideways. Now let loose of it. Now you can sit back in the chair. Now let me show you something. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to put this through there. And what I want you to do is same as I'm doing here in a minute. Lift this. Don't lift the other end at all. Move this end in a big circle. 
moves this end in a big circle, big, bigger. See, it looks like it's going through those rods. And these are, these are solid steel rods. Now also you can do this. Take this and tap. See, it's as if she's hitting something before she gets to it. Okay, thank you. You can take your seat. I'd like to show you what I call my paradox box. This is the paradox box here. And I'm going to add a corner to the paradox box. And put a corner on the inside of the box, and then, and then therefore it looks like the corner's cut off. And of course, when I punch this in there, then it's when it looks like the the, uh, it looks like you can see into the box, and then we plug this tube in here. There it is. And since the box is inside out, it looks like it's moving opposite of the tube. And all it is is this. <laughs> Paradox box. Oh, yeah, the rod. Oh, yes. This is another nail along. Where's the long Now, watch this closely. I'm going to push this rod through there. Strangely enough, it will look like it booted around the corner of the box. <laughs> and again, what you're seeing is this. And now it looks like a box. This should look like two large brass nuts. And they, they look like they're moving independently of each other, right? No, as, as if they're not firmly fastened together. Now watch, I'm going to push this, going to push this straight rod through there, and it looks like it bends to go around the corner to go through the other nut. And I can also uh, push my arm through there like that. inside out and it'll look like it's like this and it looks like it'll fall off the stick. So you tell me when you get it. Look what's going on. The white part of the cone one looks like it wants to look like a cone sticking out. Try to show what it is. Can you turn that monitor a little bit? Maybe so you can show see it. Up here. Well, that's plenty. Oh, that's plenty. Oh, that's got to go over the, under the cord.
center of this until I tell you to look away and then look at me. Okay, now look at me. I'll spin it again, and then you look at each other. Somebody else. I'll tell you when to look away. Now look at each other or whatever. <laughs> now, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to spin it the other way. When I tell you to look away, look at the back of your hand. And you'll see the skin crawl. <laughs> Call this a trizonal space warp. Looks like it warps space. Keep staring right at the center. Okay. okay, now look at the back of your hand. <laughs> now they they have a there's a toy and game company has put that out on the market. With my permission, it's, it's the same thing as that. It's a little tiny disc. You can probably find it in some stores. Probably cost you somewhere, maybe six or seven dollars. And what you do, you put it on any hard surface like a tabletop and spin it. And if you get close to it, the after effect is just as great as that. Uh, Sir, I don't think they understand completely, but let me try to explain. If you had a table and if you had three bowls of water, and if you had water as hot as you can stand, and ice water here, and water halfway between in, in the center, and you put your left hand in the hot water and your right hand in the cold water for a while. Now when you take your hands, you put this hand in this water and it seems warm, you put this hand in that same temperature water, it seems cool. Because this hand is acclimated to being in a warm condition. It's like another example, if we went back to the old days in the movies, the actors were facing extremely bright lights. And let's say you're a movie actor and you're working in a dark room. And you both come out into the sunlight, you'd say, boy, what a relief. And you'd say, man, this is blinding me. So, you get accustomed, if you, um, if the phenomena sometimes, if you were on a train and it moved very slowly, let's say it moves two miles an hour for ten minutes, pretty soon when it stops, then the ground looks like it's moving. So it's one area your vision is adjusting to, this as being normal, to it shrinking. So you're shrinking outside. It's adjusting to this being expanding. This now is normal for it. So now it looks way to reality. It's no longer in balance. Mm -hmm. 
It's a little bit like if you stare at a red circle for a while and then look at a white wall, you see a green circle. Because the red and green sensors in our mind are, are balanced. And, and this, they get fatigued. The red sensors get fatigued, so now the green overpowers them. That's uh, the best I can do. This is a, an odd thing. If I hold this up here like this, and if I stare at this coil here intently and move this away like this, this coil gets big. It goes through the other one. This coil goes through the other one. Very strange thing, I just discovered this recently. This is kind of like a pendulum hanging here, a plumb bob kind of. And I'll try to explain what happens. If I'm looking at that, obviously this would be out of focus. But when I move down while I'm looking at that, I will reach a point where this eye, this rod will be in the center of my right eye and maybe this rod would be in the center of my left eye. Now my mind knows I'm converged here. And when these rods get about centered, your wonderful mind will fuse them. Now you, you, your mind knows where you're converged, and it will tell you that these rods are down here. And what actually happens, if you start like this and look at that, what actually happens when you get down here? The, the lowest rod is right there, right there. And there's one up here and one up here. And the beautiful part is that when I swing this in a circle, your mind tells you that that string is swinging through these lines. Get a slinky, and you don't need to use the whole thing, you can cut it. And put your foot out like this, and stare at the floor right in front of your foot. And here's what's going to happen. When I get out here, right here, my eyes are going down like this, and if I have this in the right place, this strand will be in the center of one retina, and this next one in the center of the other retina. So my mind, knowing I'm converged with my toe, will tell me that this slinky is right down there, and then my toe is sticking into the thing. And take, make one of these, and go to a mirror, and look at it in the mirror, and stretch it out, and it's very strange. You get a big slinky clear through the clear in the back of the mirror so remember that get get beads that are all the same color it would actually be better if they were black get them. and time permitting you can try it if i hold this up here like this if i stare down here it's the same principles the other. If I hold this like this, now these beads look much bigger because they're closer to me. But I move this down like this, this lower beads above the uppers, the little tiny, they're half the size, and they're above the uppers and you can swing this back and forth. Like that. So remember the beads and the slinky because you can, you can do this yourself.
We chased him up. Gary, I think your truck carries over around the house. Does it? Oh, yeah. Like that. Like that. Good. Right now, moving around, your skips are kicking. Even most of we adults don't properly appreciate the wonder of life. If, if I was at a table and there was a glass there and I wanted to pick it up and drink, I don't even have to think. My arm muscles go over and the thing goes over and it picks it up. And because we can see, we don't properly appreciate the fact that we can see. And I said for years and years and years, if it were possible, and if we had a law that every human being had to be made totally blind just 24 hours once a year, so they couldn't, couldn't see anything at all, have somebody with them so they wouldn't hurt themselves, next day they can see fine. We'd much, much, much more appreciate life. And uh, I'm very lucky. I've, I'm 83 and I've been appreciating it for a goodly number of years. Uh, let me see if I can find the thing in here. Uh, well, anyway. I've, in the magic I do, I've invented that myself, and it's basically different than the other magic. And whatever interest you have, you can think of ideas that haven't been thought of before. For instance, uh, okay, I'm not a baseball fan or a football fan, but those are both sports that, that, that have been going on for ages. Who knows, but one of you sitting here might create another sport that would be entirely different, that becomes accepted and maybe 50 years from now everybody will be playing this or that. Or uh, you might realize, you do realize that we're polluting the atmosphere. Maybe one of you will someday invent an engine that runs without pollution or something else. And uh, in other words, you don't just have to sit back and do nothing but watch television. And uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes? I don't hear anything back there. What'd you say? No. All right, OK. Right, okay. I, uh, I've, over the years, I've invented new words. I have thousands of them. I don't have any definition for them, but uh, let me find some. For instance, an insignificator is something that's insignificant. Uh, or I can't, indigular. Now I know I don't have a definition for indigular, but I, I've also <laughs> thought of I thought of uh, funny diseases, and one of them I thought of was gastrophilia of the cock. <laughs> uh, one time, in, when I was in my fifties, I don't know what any of you have had what they used to call pleurisy. You, when you breathe, you feel a little pain, you know, and then, then it goes away. I'd had it many years before, but just briefly, an hour or two or something. Well, when I was in my 50s, I had this for a couple of days. Every time I breathed, I'd feel this little pain. Not enough to keep me awake or anything, but, but I was worried, you know. And so I, I, I got an appointment with a doctor, and uh, when I walked in the waiting room, there were three or four patients sitting there. And they're probably wondering what's wrong with me, you see. 
I go to the nurse and I say, I have an appointment with the doctor. She asks me right in front of all the other people, what's your problem, sir? Which is really terrible. You know, it's terrible. <laughs> and this isn't like me, but I said, well, I don't know whether I have gastrophilia of the common blood or not. <laughs> So I went in, and the doctor told me, you know, he almost took one look and he said, I guarantee you have absolutely nothing to worry about. I forget what he said it was, but he wrote a prescription. <laughs> and when I came back out, I said, no, I didn't have gastrophilia the common blood. And then she asked me if it was a real disease, and I told her no. But anyway, the funniest, <laughs> the funniest part of the story is I went to the drugstore and handed the guy the prescription, and he's in there filling it out, and I realized that, that the pain is gone. Never had it since. <laughs> now, let me tell you about an entirely different thing that happened to me. Uh, it's these, if you wish to word, use the word fool, these things fool our mind. and. Uh, many things, many times in real life we are fooled. And somebody can look at uh, the planet Mars and think it's a UFO or uh, a plane flying over way up there and see the light and figure it's a UFO. And uh, I've been fooled many times, I've been fooled many times by other magicians, but I've been fooled many times by things in real life. The one time I was over in Japan up in the top of a, a building looking out over a city, it wasn't Tokyo. And about a mile away, I saw what was apparently a round gondola moving very slowly, horizontally, over the city. And there was a tall building about a mile away, and here's the gondola coming, and now it's going to go, I, it's so far away I couldn't see the cable. And here it's going to go behind that big building. It doesn't go behind the big building, because it's a toy balloon maybe 500 feet away, floating horizontally in the breeze. And it's so far away, I had my depth perception wouldn't tell me what it was. So my mind, working on automatic pilot, if you, if you saw something big like that going across, what would you, what should you think it is? Uh, another time that was very funny, I, I got in on the plane, and a, a guy's going to pick me up at the airport. So I went to the phone and called him up to come pick me up, and then I, I had to call about a, a shipment of something coming in. And I, uh, it's hard for me to remember the story now. I, I, what happened, I can't remember the full thing is this. There are two booths. I didn't want to tie up this booth because the guy's going to call me back. That's the phone I went from. I went into the other booth to call the, the shipping company. And th just then the phone started ringing in the next booth. Well, I hung up because I thought it was my friend calling back or something. I can't remember now. And went and about a dial tone hung up, I went back in the second booth and rang it again, and this rang. And what I was doing, I, I had written down the numbers, and I got them mixed up, and I was I was phoning the booth next to him, running him trying to answer. And, oh, I, let me mention another thing that it's very natural, very natural. We have one instinct of self-preservation, and we have pride. And believe me, when you make a mistake, it's 10 times better to admit it right then, even if it's a dumb mistake, than to try to pretend that it wasn't a mistake, because it gets worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. right. How long have you been practicing? Uh, I, I got semi -centered. Probably, I'm probably 18 when I got semi-seriously interested in it. And I eventually found out that there was a magic club in Portland, Oregon. I was drafting World War II, and so I was overseas. Uh, and when I came back, I, and I, I 
went up and joined them and I hadn't been to the magician conventions and some of them had and they'd kind of be showing each other these secrets and I thought, man, you know, if they'd show me something, so I thought, and so I would come up with things to try to impress them to, so they'd show me something, which they did and I used to do some of the stuff that I learned then and eventually I realized that I was better off if I just did my own magic, so that's what I do now. And another thing I want to mention is people, intelligent people in a field, they could be a doctor or a physicist or a chemist. That doesn't mean that somebody that isn't in the field might not think of a unique, different, good idea. So we need input. I know that there are lots of uh, there are lots of people that that think they have the seventh wonder of the world. In most cases, it's it's nothing. But anyway, we need to be and and you need to keep your brain working. Do more than watch television and have fun and create things. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, let's... There are two grids here. They're about, I'd say, six inches apart. One back here, one up here. When you look at them, one of your eyeballs move. Each eye sees it from a different position, so they don't fit. And your wonderful mind turns one eye a little, another down, to converge those two images, which makes them then look like they're in one plane. And all it is is two separate grids. Call them ghost grids. Of course, if I reach out and hold this one, the other one still keeps moving. I've had these several feet apart in the effect works. Remember?